Aloha, and welcome to the 19th installment of the POD, the Pythagorean Order of Death podcast, the POD podcast. Uh, I, as hopefully always, am your host, Jonathan Barlow G, uh, or, or G, depending on how you would prefer to pronounce my name. I really don't have any preference. Uh, in this installment, it's going to be the uh, 10th Ask Me Anything uh, episode uh, edition. Uh, and this time it's being conducted with uniquely an AI, so not a human personality, but a robot personality is behind asking these questions in this case. So it has uh, created 26 individual questions in five categories uh, that were all prepared and posed to me uh, at my behest by ChatGPT, a modern online chatbot or prototypical AI. Uh, the five topics for these questions are the G complexity matrix model, my theories on tachyons and gravity, some time travel thought experiments on the Atlantean calendar and cosmic predetermination, and lastly a little about microwave gravitational pulse echolocation. The bot was most interested in the first and the last two topics, the Gee complexity matrix, the Atlantean calendar, and microwave gravitational pulse echolocation, respectively, asking six unique questions for each of these topics and only four each for the other two. So, uh, anyway, I hope that... Uh, You'll enjoy the series of questions here. There's uh, 26 of them individually, so it's going to last a little while. Uh, you might want to consider buckling in and shutting up. Just kidding. You can talk over this. You can change the channel. You can listen to music. That's a favorite thing of mine to do is listen to music over top of a uh, audio-only uh lecture or uh, in, uh, sometimes an interview video but um in this case it's just me droning on so you need not worry about uh missing anything your subconscious will be absorbing all of it whether you like it or not uh so let's proceed directly on with the show the gi complexity matrix question one How does your model of combining real, imaginary, and complex number sets as orthogonal dimensions in a 3D coordinate system challenge traditional views of dimensionality? It shouldn't be thought of as either intended or able to do so. My model is not meant necessarily to even prove useful and at this stage, it remains merely a mathematical diversion. I only just came up with a general idea in mid-October 2024, less than three weeks ago now. There remain a lot of kinks to iron out, so to speak. For example, the different number sets I chose are not all one-to-one -one with one another at their ultimate extensions and so the outermost shape for my model cannot be a perfect sphere or even cube shape, thus making it a different sort of model than, for example, a Riemann sphere. Indeed, insofar as a Riemann sphere maps the complex number plane, and such a plane also exists in my own model, it may be possible for there to be multiple Riemann-like spheres extractable from my own complexity matrix, at least one per each pseudo-dimension, which could theoretically extend beyond even merely these three, 
but that depends on if this model can be extended into higher dimensions by adding more number sets. Question two. How do you see this Gi complexity matrix model affecting the understanding of quaternions and Euclidean rotations? Since the complexity matrix is, at its ultimate extension, asymmetrical, it is itself not only incapable of being mapped to a sphere, but it is additionally incapable of expressing the repetitive fractal nature of a true quaternion. So the mathematics of trying to apply Euclidean rotations to this sort of shape and expecting it to behave like other such graphs would under the same conditions may be futile in this case. After all, any point on a 4D quaternion surface will return to the same location after a single full rotation. This obviously will not hold true for whatever asymmetrical shape the G complexity matrix turns out to be. So we can see this matrix is not a fractal quaternion, but it yet may be subject to Euclidean rotation. How do you define the orthogonality between real, imaginary, and complex numbers within the 3D coordinate system of the G complexity matrix? The orthogonality between number sets in the Gi matrix is defined by considering each distance from the origin point expressible as a combination of three coordinates, one direction expressing a real number, one an imaginary number, and one a complex number, where each of these amounts reduces to the same sum. For example, a distance pi times the square root of 2 away from the zero sum at the origin point in any direction will always total the same amount of distance, regardless of which quadrant of the graph the point being measured may appear in. So the point at distance pi square root of 2 away from zero in a more or less positive quadrant would have the same digital value as a point the same pi square root of 2 distance away from 0 in a more or less negative quadrant, and so on. Does this concept, the G-complexity matrix, extend naturally into higher dimensional complexity matrices? It certainly seems like it should. The G complexity matrix, combining one plane space each for the real, imaginary, and complex number sets, ought to be able to be transformed into a more standard quaternion type model simply by applying a fourth scalar coordinate to measure it as a vector. This would mean adding another plane space to represent a fourth form of number set operating at right angles to all the rest. At this point, there remains no reason not to continue lumping such number sets onto the model to make it compatible even with 5D or higher geometries. In the context of quaternions and Euclidean rotations, what role does the imaginary axis play in preserving vector magnitudes during rotation? I honestly do not know. It would need to be further tested by experiment to determine its form more. I do suspect, however, this model might define a realm in which I may finally meet my long-term nemesis, a Pythagorean right triangle with legs length 1, and I, and a hypotenuse of length zero. This triangle, which is mathematically accurate, has evaded finding a home for itself geometrically in any other condition of space, open and hyperbolic, flat and Euclidean, 
or closed and spherical, but it may yet fit into the space defined by the G complexity matrix. Such a triangle, if used as a measure for vector in 4D, would certainly be symbolic, at least, of the imaginary axis possessing a very significant role in preserving vector magnitudes during rotation. Could this G complexity matrix reveal any new geometric symmetries? Only if the complexity model as it is, being a three-dimensional model, can be rightly scaled up to include additional intersecting dimensional planes. If the 3D graph can correctly be rendered a 4D quaternion shape by adding a fourth number set at a right angle to the rest, then the form may regain the symmetry it apparently lacks from having unequal amounts at its infinite most extensions now. As of yet, this idea remains for me merely recreational mathematics, although I do hope it will pan out to be more. So, the second section of questions is on tachyons and gravity. And of that second set, the first question is, or follows as such. You've proposed that tachyons with imaginary mass act as the quantum of 4D spacetime and are responsible for gravity through a repulsive effect. How does this theory reconcile with general relativity, and what implications might this have for our, our, for our understanding of dark matter or dark energy? Well, first of all, you've misrepresented my claim. I have proposed the tachyons with imaginary mass act as a quantum in 4D spacetime and are responsible for transmitting gravity through a chronologically reversed repulsive effect. The idea that there exists a field of 5D tachyons at FTL speeds is called nowadays hyperspace, and the notion of this hyperspace field having a gravity-like effect pulling on our space-time continuum from beyond and outside of it may not just reconcile with Einstein's relativity field equations, but also observable reality as well. Fluctuations in this field being responsible, hypothetically, for an apparent acceleration in universal expansion as hyperspace pulls the leading edge of our local universe outward at an irregular rate. Considering tachyons as the quantum of gravity with a repulsive effect, how do you interpret gravitational lensing phenomena that seem to support attraction? The result of gravity is attraction, but the cause is repulsion. Tachyons provide an energy field medium for the long distance transmission of force to be carried between them from one object to another. Nota bene, on any size scale, from the quantum to the cosmological. This energy field apparently exists in a manner unlike our own continuum in regard to the dimension of time. Supposedly, in hyperspace, time runs backwards. But this is only time as we perceive it, from within our local universe, below light speed, as the standard arrow of entropy, extending from the Big Bang until the present, and, presumably, beyond now into the eventual future heat death of the local universe. In hyperspace, however, 
time runs in reverse. Quantum moving FTL operate in chronologically the opposite direction from how we perceive reality here and now. Tachyons apparently emanate from a source in the future and travel backwards into the past. Thus, their perfectly normal repulsive effect as quanta on other quanta is simply seen to occur in reverse, and so it appears as attractive gravity. Could there be a dual mechanism at work regarding gravity involving both repulsive and attractive forces? The explanation of tachyons being the quanta of a repulsive force that act opposite the standard arrow of entropy and thus move backwards in time is simple enough without including any polarity or dual mechanism at work. The suggestion of such implies that gravity can be both or either attractive and or repulsive when it is, from our point of view below light speed, only ever attractive. The force of electromagnetism, the quantum of which is the electron, may appear to have such a dual mechanism because it combines the previously discovered independently forces of magnetism and of electricity. However, it only combines these forces insofar as one operates at a 90 degree right angle to the other in the context of their quantum state. The magnetic poles of an electron's orbital shell are always at an exact right angle to the orbital trajectory of the electron. How might the aggregation of tachyon fields into toroidal shapes, as you've proposed, influence the formation of large-scale cosmic structures such as galaxies and black holes. If I am correct, the tachyons are the quantum of gravity, then the elemental force of gravity would have existed prior to the first photon. This is supported by current cosmological theories, which stipulate that gravity was present during the Planck epoch, less than 10 to the negative 43rd seconds after the Big Bang, while the first photon to form could not have occurred prior to the end of the electroweak era, at least 10 to the negative 12th seconds following the Big Bang, when B and W bosons could begin to bond. What this means, if tachyons are additionally toroidal in shape, is that this toroidal shape is then stamped like a template onto all forms that subsequently evolved from it. So an electron's orbital shell around a nucleus may be semi-toroidal now, with the electron's potential location existing anywhere on its orbital shell, and its magnetic poles existing exactly right-angled to the equator thereof on one end of the size scale while on the opposite end, 4D space-time itself may be hyperbolic, that is, bent convexly, or so-called saddle-shaped, like the surface of a toroid. In specific, just as like the electromagnetic field of a star is clearly wrapping up into field lines around the star's equator, at a slower rate than around its poles. Slow, so too do most black holes have white hole poles that emit iron gas jets at a right angle to the equator of the black hole. Just so in a spiral galaxy where many such stars have gathered in a draining vortex, pulled around and inward toward the core black holes, this FTL radiation, escaping the black hole's poles, arcs back around to connect to the poles of each star in such a galaxy, gravitationally affecting their electromagnetic orientation relative to the average galactic plane, which is itself equivalent to the average accretion disk 
of the core black holes. Thus, the shape of this invisible aura that connects each star's poles to the poles of the galaxy's core black holes is toroidal as well. Time Travel Thought Experiments Section 3 Out of 5 Section 3 Time Travel Thought Experiments You've explored the idea that time is a substance that can be folded into closed time-like curves, CTCs. How could this model explain phenomena like deja vu, and what are the potential real-world applications of manipulating time using CTCs? Deja vu is a symptom of false memory syndrome whereby one wrongly assumes that a situation or detail thereof has occurred to them before, when in reality it has not. The most common cause for this is from remote viewing in dreams. If one expects a certain situation to occur in their future, even unconsciously, their subconscious mind can project itself into that situation and make detailed observations about this, albeit purely hypothetical, environment. Then, later, when the person is conscious, they find themselves in that, or a similar, situation, and recall from their dream the experience or some detail thereof. Prescience in dreams is a phenomenon recorded from the beginning of human history and does not require the many-worlds hypothesis or time travel to account for it. The difference between such déjà vu in perception and actual time travel in reality is the difference between the future visited in the dream being a real location or only a dream projection. In a CTC, the future and past are real places that one can travel to along the same continuous path. However, in a dream, and so in most déjà vu as well, these events are only imaginary phantasms that, once, ag once awake again, uh, cannot be reached through any means of conventional physical travel. It should be noted that time, as we measure it on the sphere of planet Earth, is also a form of distortion to strictly linear time, similar to a closed time-like curve. Our measure of 24 hours per day corresponds to a measure of 24 time zones, or longitudinal areas on the surface of our globe. These time zones are therefore wider and thus should last longer, at the equator than near the poles, even though the different latitudes all take the same duration to elapse. Like in a CTC on Earth, the past and future may be real places that coexist simultaneously. For example, the time in Australia may be in the future, from someone's point of view in America, which may be in the relative past from the point of view of someone in Australia, and yet these places exist at the exact same moment, only in different locations on Earth's surface. Although novel, this comparison should not be underestimated, even though the restarting of each day at the international dateline may be purely conventional, it still mimics the specific form of causality loop called a time loop that restarts from a fixed point after a certain duration or event. In your time travel model involving closed time-like curves, CTCs, 
How do you think the backward flow of time might manifest in a physical experiment? Again, it is my hypothesis that tachyons, FTL quanta, travel backwards in time and that their effect on the other larger quanta of the local space-time continuum manifests as the force of gravity. This is easily demonstrable using simple billiard balls on a pool table for experimental reference. In forward-flowing time, or normal time, the player shoots the cue ball toward the clustered number balls to break their ordered formation. In backwards, or imaginary time, the balls descatter, return to their ordered formation, and the cue ball is ejected from them back to its original starting location. So what is entropy in one temporal direction is gravity in the opposite. Could there be observable signatures or paradoxes to detect? It is also my hypothesis that 5D hyperspace, the field of FTL tachyons surrounding our 4D space-time continuum, is itself a CTC, or closed time-like curve. This means the same energy being emitted from the Big Bang also arcs around in hyperspace to reconnect and be absorbed into it again. This follows the standard geometry of a torus that may emit energy from one pole to absorb it again at the opposite pole. The only difference for the toroid of hyperspace is that the poles are not visible locations of place, but are events located at opposite ends of the timeline. Thus, the Big Bang would be at one pole, and the heat death of the local universe would be at the opposite, and the latter would connect to the former through the central core axis between these, being along the dimension of time alone. Therefore, as space-time expands, it may also cause hyperspace to contract, or at least to grow thinner as a plasma-like membrane around the local universe, because they share a continuous energetic medium. Likewise, as hyperspace can appear to contract, it may be losing energy backwards in time toward the Big Bang, and thus, theoretically, it may be causing the Big Bang to continue expanding as the microwave background radiation, even in our present local universe. And this, in turn, may be pushing hyperspace to precede it at FTL speeds as well. Hence the notion of hyperspace as a CTC, specifically a self-perpetuating gin. You mentioned the concept of a temporal ripple, or echo effect, based on your personal experiment. Could this ripple effect be mathematically modeled, and how might it impact the flow of time on a larger scale? The personal experiment mentioned here refers to my posting the timestamp 123 to social media whenever I am able to do so at the actual time, 123. I suggested this sort of repetitive signal occurring at a specific time and thus all relative to one another by a regular whole number sum of equal segments, each post being separated from the next by no fewer than 12 hours, may create a temporal ripple or echo effect that could serve as a kind of pulse or beacon, a crude form of message sent out into time, broadcast in the cyberspace of the internet, and registered as such from a vast distance and duration away by anyone with a specific means of monitoring for such, a crude, for such crude messages. 
To this end, we will return to discuss microwave gravitational pulse echolocation more a little later on here. For the record, such a method of broadcasting a temporal code is almost certain to have nearly zero impact on the flow of time on a larger scale, at least unless or until someone else receives it and replies. The fourth segment, Atlantean calendar and cosmic predetermination. In your exploration of this concept, the Atlantean calendar, how do you balance the ideas of predetermination and free will at a cosmic scale? The free will of people has negligible effect on a cosmic scale. As a nearly type 1 civilization, we are currently only just beginning to be able to detect and deflect inbound asteroids such as the one responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs. To this effect, we have a larger range of influence than the dinosaurs, but far less than to be able to block and survive a Carrington-type event. Prolonged X-class solar flare, or so-called kill shot of radiation emanating at us from our star. Free will, applied to altering natural outcomes by rearranging nascent elements into new technologies designed for accomplishing these goals, only extends our reach so far, and although it is safe to predict the continuation of the trend of its expansion, it depends wholly on the presence of people or other sentient life forms with free will or independent agency. The presence of free will is thus not universal, but only occurs wherever people, or similar sentience, go. For the rest of non-living matter energy in our local universe, all motions remain predetermined exclusively by the laws of physics and by their own past tra trajectories. Can the model of the Atlantean calendar account for quantum uncertainty and chaos theory. The Atlantean calendar is designed to provide a detailed mechanism for examining the exact environmental conditions most likely at any given location on the planet over a duration sufficient to measure these changes across multiple ice ages. It is based on a simple calendar round model arranging the 12 zodiac signs in a circle that can then be read in one direction throughout the months of the mean year, or in the opposite direction for the 12 aeons, spans of 2,000 mean years each, of the great year of 24,000 mean years total. Insofar as the environmental changes occurring in this Ice Age cycle repeat with little variation, the calendar can make more exact predictions. However, to the extent that any randomizing factors may arise, either from within the system being measured, that is, from people on Earth influencing the Ice Age cycle by pollution, or other forms of more deliberate geoengineering, or from outside of this system, that is, from asteroids or solar flares that may affect massive changes to this cycle, at more or less unforeseeable times. The calendar's ability to accurately predict the impacts of such events on the system it measures drops to nearly zero. In other words, the calendar model may be able to estimate the sunspot cycle's peaks, peaks and troughs, but it cannot accurately predict when an X-class solar flare might erupt in a Carrington event that could erase all life on Earth. How do you see the Atlantean calendar interacting with known physical laws, such as thermodynamics or entropy, particularly in relation to cosmic cycles? The Atlantean calendar is an idealization of the Ice Age cycle 
But whenever random events or free will intervene in it, its ability to make accurate predictions breaks down completely. As an idealization, moreover, it is symbolic rather than strictly scientifically accurate, and thus it represents the Ice Age cycle in an idealized way, all else being equal, similar to Kepler's model of the local planetary orbits being based on circumferences associated with the nesting of the five platonic solids. In other words, while not reflecting the reality of the situation perfectly, this model provides an approximate average or baseline from which to determine variations in reality. For example, the calendar may predict a certain kind of climate for a given location at a certain approximate date and time, but this may not be, ag this may not be exactly reflected in reality for a number of reasons. Thus, the calendar is useful as a tool for making estimated predictions about future events, though it is not necessarily accurate 100% of the time. Is there an underlying mechanism that allows for the balance of predetermination with free will? No. In the absence of such an underlying mechanism, to balance between the forces of determinism and free will implies that, just as now determinism vastly outweighs free will on a cosmic scale, perhaps ultimately free will will one day be able to reverse this ratio. This is to say that if manifestation of solid objects by mind over matter is in any way possible, then humanity's free will may someday become a threat to the natural order of our entire local universe. Could quantum, could quantum indeterminacy, as described in Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle, have an influence on the accuracy of the Atlantean calendar in predicting cosmic events? While the uncertainty of quantum attributes, such as position and momentum, may have an effect on clairvoyant prophecy of the future, that is, precognition by dream, fever, or intoxication, the Atlantean calendar does not rely on perception, which can be distorted by such quantum effects but is instead a mechanical sort of system for making predictions using finite sums of variable attributes to describe different environmental conditions at different times. Using such a system rather than one's own perception alone reduces noise in this process caused by quantum uncertainty. How would this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle affect the scale of cosmic time you're dealing with. Quantum scale uncertainty has a diminishing effect on larger scale celestial events. While, for example, one quantum may tunnel through another, we would never see such an effect occurring for planets or stars. Likewise, while some quanta can exist in a condition of superposition, exhibiting multiple, even contradictory traits at once, no present celestial object can be likened to this phenomenon. So, an electron's orbital shell may take on a very different geometric pattern than the usual flat planes of orbital ellipses we perceive for planets and stars. Even in terms of the most esoteric interpretation of quantum effects, where wave function collapse is believed to be due to operant observer principle, we do not see this phenomenon occurring ubiquitously the same throughout the entire universe, only here and there, and only under certain conditions. So it remains unlikely in this case as well that such quantum scale effects have any significant parity or impact in the realm of cosmic scale time.
Microwave Gravitational Pulse Echolocation. How do you envision using this microwave gravitational pulse echolocation technique to detect or even interact with time travelers? The method of microwave gravitational pulse echolocation is meant to allow a time traveler to be tracked from their original space-time event location and to allow the time traveler themselves to be able to find their way back to the original space-time event location from which they arrived. Eventually, this sort of method should be able to allow the time traveler at event location X to contact directly back and forth with their home base at event location Y, where Y may be vastly earlier or later than X. However, in its most rudimentary form, this method acts like a beacon, a signal broadcast out in all directions of space and time from both the source and the traveler that can still only be detected, theoretically, from a certain amount of distance duration away, in the same way a lighthouse can only be seen once one is a certain distance out from the shore. What challenges or breakthroughs do you foresee in the development of this microwave gravitational pulse echolocation technology? The actual technology of time travel itself aside. The technology of microwave gravitational pulse echolocation requires two essential components. One, a portable projector that broadcasts a gravitational microwave signal outward along the time axis. Two, a receiver capable of recognizing this microwave background radiation field and distinguishing a regularly pulsed rhythm as apart from the rest of the phased static. If one can send and receive pulsed signals in this way, then ultimately, even direct two-way communication between a time traveler and their home base may be possible. This sort of a beacon system could, theoretically, function regardless of which type of time travel ultimately proves possible, if any, including the many worlds, model of splitting timelines, or any variety of CTCs, such as causal loops, time loops, gin, etc. In other words, this premise may be able to function in a way that can unify a time traveler's frame of reference to our own and thus connect our current local universe to another universe next door to ours that is more or less identical along a parallel dimensional vector of time. How would the technology of microwave gravitational pulse echolocation be practically applied to detect and track objects that have undergone time travel. In the same way we can use a telescope aimed into outer space to observe a massive gamma ray burst now. In the future, we will develop technology that will be able to look out across the time dimension like a telescope sees through space, and we will be able to see phenomena occurring in this realm, like the gamma ray burst in deep space, that we will not fully understand at first, but that, over time, we will explore and learn more about, until, eventually, we may harness the same effects in principle ourselves, such as by creating a massive gamma ray burst. Just as we can use glass lenses in a telescope, to focus light from distant objects. We may use gravitational lensing effects aligned alike the glass lenses in a telescope in an essentially similar way to observe through time. Ultimately, as I've speculated, 
We will also apply these gravitational lenses to sending out microwave gravitational pulses through time as well, just as nowadays we send satellites and probes to broadcast electromagnetic signals in space. Would the microwave gravitational pulse echolocation signal processing involve new mathematics to account for temporal shifts? In terms of a tachyonic anti-telephone, being a device that can receive a signal before it is sent, which is essentially the end goal of microwave gravitational pulse echolocation, being a device that can send a signal through time, there would definitely need to be a new mathematics, possibly a whole new field of study entirely, devoted to this outcome. However, for experiments using microwave gravitational pulse echolocation to be performed does not require time travel to have been proved, and so by sending pulsed signals across time, we may come to discover how time travel can occur and thus eventually arrive at the tachyonic anti-telephone. Sending signals blindly across the time dimension by itself should not require any maths that contradict general and special relativity principles. However, once we begin aiming these messages, as in arcs that bend back again to their own origin in a CTC, then we will need to begin modifying existing equations to conform to new observations regarding the nature of time, the speed of light, the cause of gravity, etc. What kind of challenges do you foresee in calibrating this microwave gravitational pulse echolocation technology to differentiate between naturally occurring gravitational anomalies and those caused by deliberate time travel events? If a time traveler goes into their own past, they will immediately begin affecting their target reality as soon as they arrive there. However, the impact a single time traveler makes in redefining their timeline's entire history has no mechanism by which to split their new timeline apart from the old in a single universe-wide event. And so the effect the time traveler has on the splitting timeline begins to be begins by being isolated to their physical proximity, but then expands asymptotically faster and faster the longer they stay in their past. Thus, if a time traveler goes to their past and moves a chair, the effect of this will begin small, causing changes to the timeline only in locations nearby to the disruptive event. But this field of influence will grow in all directions to affect a larger and larger area. This means the offspring timeline created by the time traveler will be occurring within the mainstream timeline, their original location, and thus siphoning energy off from the mainstream timeline to sustain itself. All these effects may be measurable given the proper forms of tools with which to do so. Distinguishing between a naturally occurring gravitational anomaly, such as a baby universe inside a black hole, and a deliberate time travel event, such as an offspring timeline inside the mainstream timeline, should be sufficiently simple, considering that an offspring timeline necessarily takes the form of an expanding CTE, while a baby universe inside a black hole does not. Could quantum effects obscure the results of microwave gravitational pulse echolocation? The premise of microwave gravitational pulse echolocation is essentially the same as Einstein's concept of a gravitational wave, such as caused by colliding black holes and detected in 2015 AD 
by the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, only much, much smaller, more concentrated, and laser-focused. Because a gravitational wave front propagates on average at light speed, its effects can be observed from a distance before, while, and after they occur. Considering the effects of such a gravitational wave that is the width of a single photon ray would require examining observations made of gravitational waves in space and then scaling these down to the size of a laser beam. Because quantum effects do not serve to disrupt the results obtained by measuring gravitational waves, it stands to reason that they would not disrupt the results obtained by measuring microwave gravitational pulses either. So that then is the totality and the sum totality of... Uh, episode 19 of the POD podcast, the Pythagorean Order of Death uh, podcast uh, broadcast here on YouTube, so far only on YouTube. To the five or so patrons of mine, the YouTube allows to see it. So thank you very much for allowing me to platform my crazy scientific theories, pseudoscientific theories here. And uh, thank you to everybody who's tuned in and is continuing to tune in to listen to me chatter on this outro. And uh, other than that, I just hope that everything is working out well for you all in my future as you're watching this and looking back on me in your past. Uh... As always, um, peace and um, I guess that's all. Peace.